Jonas, welcome. Thank you. Jonas and I have had a chance to chat a number of times, and one of the things that he said to me that's, that's quite striking in its simplicity, but um, has definitely turned out to be the case in my career, is that nothing happens the way it's supposed to. So I was hoping that you might be able to elaborate on what you mean by that in a career context, and, uh, and we can start from there. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, let's start off by just, I'll apologize up front. Um, You'll see why as we go through this with some of the commentary that comes out, but uh, <laughs> I think it's a lighter approach to kind of get things across and, and then we'll go from there. But um, so what does it mean to say that things don't go as, as you plan them to? So I think back to when I was in university and um, I switched my major three times. Um, I remember dated a girl for five years, uh, broke up in the final year. Uh, final year decided not to finalize my or to finish in accounting and actually finished in management um, and then got very paranoid about what was I going to do for my first job and uh, went through the whole interview process very worried that no one was going to hire, it was a tough time, the economy wasn't great and didn't really take any time to think about well, what happens if you get two job offers. And so then I ended up getting two job offers and was wondering well wait a minute this is the biggest decision of my life if I don't choose the right place my whole career will come to an end, I'm not going to make money, I won't get married, I won't be able to buy a house. This is the most important decision I'll ever make. And then you realize that you take the first job and then you're there and you're thinking, oh, i got to stay here the rest of my life because they have a pension or they do RRSP matching or, you know, what else is out there. This is a secure job. And you go through all these things, at least that's what happened for me. And what you eventually realize is that there is no path. I mean, I think the path is enjoying the experiences that you go through to sort of develop your skill set, your personality, and then that's what sort of formulates your career. And so as I look at my path going through uh, everything that I went through, that's what came to the conclusion, is that there's no path, there's no right way. Um, you have to consume yourself with all the things that are important to you. So if it's family, if it's ethics, if it's sports, if it's travel, whatever those things are, you really got to take them, think about them, absorb them, and then define your career. And I think it's very different. I think it's different for millennials. I think it's different for my age group. I think it's different for our parents. In our parents' era, they had one job. They did it for 25 years or 30 years, and then that was it. Um, I remember when I left Canadian Tire, um, my father was like, you can't do this, you need to stay here, it's good, you get stock, you get RSP, why are you going to travel around the world taking 16 year olds to whether it be Australia or whether it be to California or whether it be to Halliburton, whatever it is I was doing for $50,000 a year when you can work at Canadian Tire and make stock and grow and you know, retire when you're 65. And, and that's a good job for a lot of people, but what I came to realize is that wasn't my path. And so once I became comfortable with that, opportunities for me and how I wanted to go through my career became a lot more available. Yeah, I mean, I think for depending on different ages in the audience, a lot of us, when we were going through high school and university, it's like, you know, you have to take, you know, choose your path to be able to choose your prerequisites in high school to get those courses in university, to graduate with that degree, to get the job. Like, I mean, it's this kind of really linear path. And I guess, I think a lot of people then move to like, oh, choose your passion, you know, that, that kind of a mentality, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. I guess the question that I have is like for anybody that's sitting here, because I think a lot of this is applicable to us as CPAs who we get our designation, we're maybe not thrilled at where we are at this certain point in our career. I know I've done that like 10 times at this point. Um, how do you, like what are the criteria or the process that you use to think about, you know, you've made these different jumps and how does that turn into a story that leads you to a career that makes sense? Well, I haven't figured out that last part yet. <laughs> but uh, everything before that I can tell you is that just like everything you do in your job, you make decisions. You, you have to weigh risk versus reward, no matter what you're doing. You can be in customer service, you can be in finance, you can be a developer. You're always managing between risk and reward. So if you're a developer and you have a deadline and you need to get something out, you're going to have to measure the risk of how much QA do we do before we launch the particular product. If you're in finance and you know 
sales is coming to you and saying, we have this great opportunity, we should cut our fees in half because we're going to be X, you know, we're going to do X number of sales, then again, there's a risk and reward measure to that. So the same is in your career path. You got to constantly evaluate where you are. Are you married? Do you have investments? Are you, um, do you have children? Yeah. Um, are you willing to take on risk? Are you willing to walk away from the secure job that says, please come sit here, please work on these very specific tasks, don't look over there, you're not allowed to talk to those people, don't work over there because we're not, we don't really care what your opinion is over there, we need you to do this. And for a lot of people that works out well. Clearly I think you guys can early on see that would not work very well for me. And so for me, uh, part of choosing how I've gone about my career is once I realized that my mantra or my, uh, my brand, because I think everyone, I think that's really important, you know, whether you communicate or market that you are a brand, the truth of the matter is we're all a brand, you go in for interviews, you're competing against other people, so you have to create a brand. And for me, my brand was, I was jack of all trades, expert of none. And what I learned uh, very early on is that there is a whole career uh, available for people who are jack of all trades and experts of none. That gives me hope. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I really, uh, you know, I, for me that, that resonates quite a bit. And I guess the kind of question that comes out of that is if, you know, you're in one of those positions right now. I mean, we all did uh, corporate jobs because we're all CPAs. So at some point or another, we had to do that stuff. Um, you know, what, what do you think is that, that point when somebody should be like, hey, this isn't for me. How do you, how do you make that decision? Because I think a lot of us, sometimes you just have a crappy day at work and you're like, oh, well, forget this. I'm going to go get a new job. And that's probably not the right way to make that decision. So how do you, how do you kind of think about it in, in your mind and go, okay, I've done this and it's not for me. Now I'm going to try something else because you've done that more than once. Yeah. Um, I think, I think part of it is immaturity and maturity work both for you and against you. So immaturity <laughs> is I worked at Canadian Tire. Uh, it really was uh, one of the best places I ever worked. I think um, the great thing about Canadian Tire is that they have a whole training facility. So, you know, you get hired at Canadian Tire, you go into supply chain, you don't actually see the floor for three months. You're in a training room, everything is sort of running, and you're just sort of in the background seeing how it works and you really learn how to do the job. And so, um, I, think, I think that part, I sort of lost my train of thought here, but I think that, well, Tell me the question. <laughs> Just how, how do you know, like when you're, in, when you're in your job and you're like, okay, oh. this is wrong for me, how do you know that it's like, okay, now it's really time to consider a, yeah. a bigger okay, shift? Sorry. So, you're in, so you're doing that thing. I think what you're looking for is are you being challenged? When you go home at the end of the day, are you making a difference? And so my thing at Canadian Tire was the immaturity part was I would, my friends or I'd meet people on the street and they'd say, what do you do for a living? I'd be like, I work at Canadian Tire. And they would say, what store do you work at? And in my immaturity level, that really bothered me because I was working in supply chain. It was a corporate job. It was a very, it had a lot of meaning to it. I was, you know, dealing with over a thousand different SKUs and that from the immaturity level, it, it wasn't meeting my need at that time. I wanted to be respected. I wanted to be growing my career and I felt like I was being pigeonholed. So that's the immaturity part. The, the part of immaturity that works though is that you feel like the world's in front of you. You have lots of years. You can afford to make mistakes. And, and you can follow your dreams and passions and so then that part helps you out and that helps you sort of drive to the next position. Then on the maturity side is obviously the obvious part is that you think about, um, you know, I got responsibilities so I need to take a job that will cover my expenses or whatever those reasons are that you make them. But on the other side of maturity is you start thinking about who you are and you think about what you want to do. And so for me, um, I drive down the street and I look at buildings and I look at bridges and I'm always amazed by buildings and bridges because these people one day will take their children in their cars or on their motorcycles or they'll walk down the streets and they will say to someone, I built that, I built that, I laid that brick, I designed that bridge, I designed that house and their children get to see everything that they did. And for me at Canadian Tire, I wasn't or really anywhere I was before I got into the startup world at Ernst & Young, I mean, it's not like I can take my kid to the front of the building and say, 
I helped do those financial statements, or I helped, <laughs> you know, get road salt from, you know, out there to over to this store. I mean, my kid would be, that's great. Like, what does that mean? And so you start <laughs> thinking about your legacy, you start thinking about what you want to do, and, and this misconception is that accountants are black and white. And I don't think that's true. And um, for those who don't know, I'm, actually, I'm a CPA CMA. And uh, one of the reasons why I chose CMA is because when I was deciding what I wanted to do, they had a commercial. And the commercial had Laurentian pencil crayons. I don't know if everyone knows what those are, but when I went to school, you could either get 12, 24, or 48 pencil crayons. You took them to school and you did your coloring. And I was like, they get it. Yes, we're strong you know, with financials, we like numbers, we're good at analytics, but you know what, we also have a creative side to us. And once I realized that I can't sing, uh, I have lyrics deficiencies, so it's not like I can you know, go and do uh, sing on a stage or act or anything like that. You're not gonna get a beaver performance? No, no beaver performance. I can't, I can't draw. Uh, I, I, like I said, I'm an expert of nothing. Um, <laughs> But what I do have is a creative side. I, have, I want to do more than one thing. And so once I realized that, it became very clear to me that I had to find a job, I had to find a career that allowed me to pursue the things that I wanted to do, which is I want to be analytical sometimes, but I also want to talk about creative things. I want to talk about how, how we're going to get people to download our app. I want to talk about how we need to improve customer service to make the experience better. And so long-winded answer, but basically what I'm saying is, it's not, it's, it's not definitive. If you make the wrong decision to move your career, it's how wrong is it? You go and you choose another career, you move on. You, if you don't move on and you just settle for this, you know, the last minute before you close your eyes for the last time, what thoughts are you gonna have in your mind? I didn't try this, I didn't try that, I didn't try this, I didn't try that. So I think, I think you know when you're ready to move on, if, you're, if you want to explore, the only way you can explore is by doing things. You can't just sit at a cubicle and say, yeah, I'm exploring. Yeah, I, I mean, I know what you mean because I, personally, I had that experience. I was at EY and same deal, EY is a great company, but I was not an auditor. Uh, I mean, I was an auditor, but I wasn't an auditor. Um, and you, I think a lot of us feel like we're pigeonholed into a particular path, but I mean, there's enough CPAs out there and hopefully the Luminary events have brought enough of them to light to convince everybody that there are different paths associated with us. But I think we, I think we should say something about Ernst & Young and all the different firms, and that is I don't say it in a negative context. I, my career, I'm, I'm actually very lucky. I, looked, I worked at one of the largest retail companies in Canada, um, was there while they competed directly with Walmart, um, and really got to see how smart people with, with real strategy and real direction were able to compete and survive and grow. And so I learned a lot about that. And in the accounting world, um, although we all make the jokes about certain aspects of the challenges that come that working in the firm life, um, it, taught us, it taught me professionalism. And I cannot tell people how few people understand that art of professionalism, the, what the word done means. Like the word done, it's amazing, but like for a lot of people, if you're building a new product, so you have to have a business needs, so you gotta develop that, then you have to develop a strategy, a go-to market, a design, you have to do all these things. And literally, most people will say once they're done their job, they're done. And very few people understand that done means all the way through to the end, and on to uh, the consumer using, using the product. Yeah. And I did learn that at Ernst & Young, uh, for all those RFPs that I had to compete, complete, that went to nowhere on the risk consulting side, but that's okay, that's what we did. We always had the most professional deck that went out. It, there was no spelling errors, there was no, everything was like perfectly done. And at the time it may have been frustrating or annoying or when we were on engagements, making sure that everything was done and all the documentation was done in a certain format. But when you go into the other side of the world, you don't realize that that's like such a great skill that we did learn at the big firms and I don't know that we would have it if we didn't do that. 
That's interesting. I, I, I mean, I never really think about that, but it's, it's definitely the, the case because you see it in all of the CPAs that do all of, all of what they do. And I'm, I'm sure it really comes out, especially when you're dealing with a lot of people that come from non-professional backgrounds. And uh, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's uh, wow. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to jump now into the lightning round. You're not supposed to read the questions. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm more thinking about how hot it is in here. But yeah, that's okay. yeah, again, apologies for that. Um, maybe we can get, hey, Namita, you want to grab us like some uh, paper towel or something? I don't know. Yeah. Be real, be real classy up here. Um, At this point, just bring soap. <laughs> a full shower. So we're going to do our lightning round. And the idea here is that we're going to ask Jonas like a bunch of quick questions, like should be one phrase, one, for, one, one word answers um, to get to uh, know him a little bit better. So right off, right off the bat, um, what's the most... Yes, Denise. Uh, we did. A, right. We apologized up front, so I think it's fair. Yeah, yeah. We're allowed. We're allowed to do this. Is the casual, intimate event. I should have been wearing my hoodie, and then I'd be dripping too. But um, sponsored by paper towel. Yeah, sponsored by bounce. Scotties or bounce. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's uh, let's kick this off with what is the most outrageous thing one of your kids has said or done. <laughs> is that a long list? <laughs> They're so young. I mean, six, two and a half, and uh, and uh, and ten months. So the most outrageous thing they've done. Oh, just the other day, it was Mother's Day, and uh, my six-year-old said, um, "How come there's no such thing as, as as Children's Day?" And we looked at him and we said, "Well, what do you what do you mean? Like, well, we're making mommy dinner, like breakfast today, but like, how come there isn't a day?" when you guys make me breakfast. And we looked at him and we said, <laughs> what is every other day? And he's like, I don't get it. <laughs> Not gifted, I guess. <laughs> Not true. Scratch that from the tape. So, so the apple didn't fall too far from you. Something like that. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, one of your things is that you're, you're a jack of all trades. You do all sorts of stuff. But one, what's one thing that you can't do even if your life depended on it? Sing. Okay, should we make him sing? No, I won't. I won't, I won't do that. I, I, won't. I have lyrics deficiency, so I, I couldn't sing anything anyway. Okay, fair. Like, I, like literally, I do, uh, again, my kids are young, so I'll do Itsy Bitsy Spider, and th the kids sing it to me, and they're like, no, you got it wrong. <laughs> like, I just, I just can't do it. All right, all right, so your kids didn't get that deficiency. No, yeah, no they're, they're more like my wife. <laughs> um, this, is, this is one that we like to ask uh, uh, everybody. What, what, what accounting buzzword do you think best describes your personality? Uh, surplus. Surplus. Nice. Okay. Good choice. Um, all right. Now this one. This one. I'm sure you're going to be really excited to to talk about. Um, what are your thoughts on IFRS nine effective January first, 2018? I, I have an answer for this. Do you? Yeah. Oh, geez. I actually wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Call your auditors. <laughs> Good, nice. Okay, because that was that was just a troll question. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what's you know you work at a company that is constantly um, doing everything around like sports and entertainment. So, what's like the coolest perk or the like best event that you got to go to because of your job? So I've been to a few. Uh, I'm not gonna lie about that. Um, I I've been to the Super Bowl. I uh, went last year in uh, in Minnesota, but that was not uh, the greatest event. Um, the greatest event was uh, Edwin uh, Encarcion's home run uh, in the playoffs against, uh, I guess it was Baltimore. Uh, that was pretty great. And we had one of our uh, partners in. So it really was, uh, we were growing the partnership and uh, things were going well. And, and I'm not gonna lie, after he hit that home run, the, the partnership and the relationship got a lot better. And it was, uh, <laughs> we should probably thank the Toronto Blue Jays for. Uh, for making that happen. There you go. All right. But but I will say everyone should you know, not everyone should go. The Super Bowl is a made-for-TV event. That's what I'll say. It really is a great experience. It's more um, everything that's going outside the event. Um, unfortunately, um, in Minnesota and you know about 15 degrees colder than here in in, in that time of year, it's uh, 
you could choose a better location to go to. Fair, yeah. Um, okay, just wait, show of hands, who here actually knows what IFRS 9 is? All right, we are great accountants in this bunch. Um, yeah, so we're gonna jump into the second part of the, the, of the chat tonight. The, probably the, the thing that uh, everybody here is really interested to learn about from Jonas, it's all about his time at uh, Fan Exchange, scaling a startup. So the way that we're gonna do this, is we're actually gonna have kind of like four topics. Um, I'm just gonna kind of introduce the topic. We'll have a chat for maybe like two minutes on it and then we're just gonna take questions from the audience. Uh, and if you can, try to keep it within that topic. We'll do a general Q&A at the end if anybody wants to ask Jonas what he eats for breakfast or what he made his kid for breakfast on Mother's Day or whatever it was. But, uh, but yeah, so like num number one, I think a question that comes up a lot when you're talking about um, titles like Chief Operating Officer is like, what the heck do you actually do? Um, so if you could just like for a, a, a minute or two talk about what you do, why you're a COO rather than a CFO, um, and, and what, does that, what does that really mean in the context of, uh, of a scaling startup? Yeah, so let me answer the second part and then the first part. So, so why, how did I become the COO of Fan Exchange and, and why not the CFO? And, and the answer is actually um, quite simple and I think everyone will appreciate it, is that I think well, first of all, I think if you lined up nine accountants and I was the tenth, and someone said to you, "Put in order of who you think the accountant is," I would probably be the tenth person. Um, and, and and I actually I like being that person, the tenth in the line, because I think it I think it describes where not every accountant needs to go, but where some of us in this profession need to go. And so um, the reason why I chose the route of COO is because everyone who needs me to be the CFO knows I am the CFO of Fan Exchange. So when we're engaged in discussions with our board and we're presenting financial statements, I'm seen as the CFO. When we're out there raising money uh, and we're down in the valley or up here in Toronto, then I'm seen as the CFO. Uh, when we're dealing with shareholders, when we're dealing with our lawyers, and in those circumstances, um, everyone will see me and understand me as the CFO. When we're out there in the rest of the business, which there's a bigger part to the business than just that, and so if I'm supporting our business development team, if I'm supporting or overseeing customer service, or supporting account management, or really any aspect of the business, um, I think there's something about being the COO which has a more wide-ranging breadth of knowledge of how the company operates in terms of not just the numbers, not just the policies and the procedures, but actually how the day-to-day -day mechanics of the business works. And so, um, just as we want to be seen, uh, well, I don't know if everyone does, but I look at myself as an accountant and I want to be seen as different than a traditional accountant. I want to be seen as creative. The other side of it is I actually find people get intimidated when they hear there's a numbers person in the room. And what can be a very open and honest and general conversation where everyone's contributing ideas, they, start, they sort of sit back and everyone sort of refers to the CFO. And, and so that was just a personal choice. Um, that being said, as we continue to grow, I think at some point um, things will change and I'll have to make a decision and probably rethink that process and work with Brandon and Sean, the founders, and, and determine what makes more sense. But for where we were as a company, it made sense to do that. In terms of what I do day to day, um, it's very different than when I started. When I started, we were 14 people. Uh, I spent a lot of time on streamlining our accounting procedures and policies. Um, the policy thing is tough. You walk into a company, um, there's people who are there that have been there from the beginning. They're really connected with the founders. They don't have really any skill set, but they're loyal and they've been there and they do whatever it takes. And so, um, you have to work through those things. And so part of my job early on is trying to define people's roles, trying to create policies that don't impact the culture, um, try and um, <laughs> create a streamlined accounting process. I'll never forget this, walking in there the first day and um, checks were being written by hand, they were being written by, uh, I hate to say this, but out of QuickBooks, um, sorry in the back. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, and there wasn't a consistent checking number and you know the ledgers were all messed up and so you start off doing all that stuff. And then once we grew a little more and I could build out the accounting team and I had a controller, 
now I started moving into other sides of the business, which was helping on the BD side, helping to launch some of our larger partnerships. Um, I had experience working with financial institutions from my time at Berkeley Payment Solutions, so I started getting involved in onboarding. Um, I've always had HR floating around me, and so that part has always remained as part of my uh, responsibilities. And then you start, so <laughs> You got the account management side, you're working a little bit on the business development side, you've got what in essence is the operations team, and then there's customer service and fulfillment that's sort of flowing around. And so I started, uh, somehow that part rolled up into me as well. Um, but so today, so that all, those things happen, we continue to hire. Um, and now today, I spend a lot of my time actually working with the leaders of those groups and trying to help them define their strategy, define their goals, define their KPIs, to try and measure success. I, I'm actually a leader who I would say, well let me say I'm, I don't want to define myself by myself as a leader. What I do in the office every day is I have two mottos. One is, um, let's just be better than we were yesterday. I think that's key. And number two is, I don't really care what any of the KPI results are. I care what the trends of the results are. So tell me what we've done over the last period of time, and as long as things are heading in the right direction, I know we're gonna get there. But that's kind of what I do now on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so it, you, you can't really fit it into a one-line description. Uh, no, it would be a very long business card. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. that's right. So uh, now I think we'd like to throw it to the audience. If anybody wants to, again, like we're gonna go through, we have a couple of different topics. So we'll see if this works, but if somebody has any questions around like, what's a COO's job at a startup, anything in that realm, uh, yeah, time, time is now. Yeah, we got one right up front here. I'll just give you the mic. Hi, I have a question for you. Um, in terms of moving from a corporate career to startups, I have an interesting uh, time of my life. Is I was in New York, I left my role, stay stable role, who's the reason that you said I was happy wasn't dynamic. And my question to you is, if you don't want to go in the startup, because I feel like people are more dynamic, that's where the future is for CPA, and you want to become a CFO, how do you actually start? Given that you work for Big Four, you're not a junior, you, you work in accounting policy, you know what that first line is, <laughs> and everything else. The one person so here. how do you really get into this? So, so, number one, I don't know what IFRS 9 is. <laughs> and, and, and I don't think, you, and it's good that you do know it. And, uh, and I, I, it's good to know we both worked in New York. Uh, I actually lived in Connecticut and drove in every day. It was crazy. Um, but I can't answer that question directly, but I'll answer it indirectly. And what I'll say is, um, I don't think it works that way. I don't, think it, I don't think it's helpful to go in there and say, I have done X number of years and I want to go work in the startup world now so, and because I have this much experience, I need to be the CFO. I think what you have to decide is what career path do you want? And I think when you go into the startup world, at least in my opinion, you really have to do a couple things. One is you have to really um, understand and make sure there's a synergy between you and the founders. I can't, I can't, I just can't explain how important that is, more important than anything else. That any other decision you'll make about joining the startup world is how do you think you'll interact with the founders? Um, and then two is, um, every startup that doesn't have a financial leader needs one. But they also need a COO, they also need a CRO, they also need a CMO, and they need every other position with a C under the sun. And the truth of the matter is they can't hire any of them when they're starting out. And so it's not so much about the title, it's about if you want to oversee the finance side of a startup, then you go around um, interviewing or finding ways to engage with founders or VCs or even you know banks now are getting heavily involved and in, in, in sort of engaged in the startup world. And through your connections, you start meeting with different founders, and then you get involved in the finance side. Once you're in there, and if you have a passion for what they're doing, and you see the growth, and they start raising funds, when they raise funds, and you can even do this as part of your employment agreement, which states basically is, 
I'm going to come in. I want to help you. I want to be part of this. And as we raise money, I would like to see my profession. I'd like to see my career progress in the company and continue to grow, whether that be from the compensation package, whether it be from what your job title is. But I think if you want to leave uh, the corporate world, um, then I think you say, I'm ready for a change. And you go into the opportunity, understanding that early on, it may not be as rewarding from a compensation perspective, but that you're looking for the bigger picture. Hopefully that answers your question. It does. I think it's an experience. And sometimes in the corporate world, it could be just financial reporting, yeah. where in this case, you can have an exposure. CFO is not just financial reporting. It's also ability to raise capital and strategy and all that stuff, right? Yeah. I think it's beyond that. I think it's 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 as equivalent to being a, a COO. And I assure you, if you go in the startup world, it will be an experience, one way or another. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your question there. Um, anybody else on this particular topic? And then we'll, if not, we can jump to the next. And I mean, obviously, they're all intertwined. So, oh, yeah, got one over here. Oh, yeah, Marco just got that covered. Um, so as the COO here. I guess involved in getting a lot of a lot of things actually done at, within the company. And coming from accounting backgrounds, a lot of us normally sit back and do a lot of analysis and aren't really involved in day-to-day -day activities. So if you're making the transition from a more analytical to an activity-based position, what kind of skill sets do you kind of need to learn and develop and what would be the best way to go about developing those skills? Because they seem to be quite different from sitting back and analyzing and actually getting things done. I 100% agree with you. And um, this goes back to my weird, strange career path that sort of gave me the upper hand in the end. Because, well, certain people were out there really specializing in particular skills. I was sort of getting a taste of everything and then using that to, to, pull, aside, to pull together my career. But a couple things. One, I think these courses, and I'm not just plugging them, but I think the courses they're doing will be very helpful. Um, and the reason I say that is because part of it is in the interview process, right? And being able to speak to the things. Um, so that's number one. And then number two is everyone had part-time jobs. Or, well, again, I don't want to assume everyone had a part-time job, but I think a lot of us had part-time jobs. And so for me, um, it's funny, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm 42 years old and I seem to keep going back to when I was a camp counselor. And um, for whatever that reason is, I find that there's a lot of skills that I use today that come from that. Um, and the irony of being a camp counselor and then eventually as assistant section and then a director of a camp is that um, I was dealing with kids that were anywhere from the age of 6 to 16 and then I was dealing with staff that were closer to my age only a few years apart. And what I'm going to say next uh, is not to insult employees, it's not what I'm saying, but there's a lot of similarities between that age group all the way through and what I do day to day in the workplace. And so when you want to make that jump, what I would say is don't just think about your audit experience, go all the way back. Think about if you were working at McDonald's and the manager and the operations of putting together a hamburger and how much ketchup goes on, how much mustard and how much onions and how much tomatoes. Well, there's no tomatoes on McDonald's hamburger, but there's pickles. Um, and then think about what, if you work there, think about what happens when someone says no pickles. And then what, it, what has to happen and what's the process. And I know that sounds crazy, but the truth of the matter is a lot of those things that you did in your earlier career, you can bring them back and you can reuse them and you can use them for your career. So that's number one. I don't think you just have to say, I've been in audit all these years and therefore I'm stuck in audit. I also had the luxury of, I wasn't in audit, I was on the consulting side, so I acknowledge the relationship side, the interaction, the negotiation on you know, what process, how we're measuring that process, the risk was always part of my role, so it was a little bit different. And then the second thing uh, um, that I would point out is that to join the startup and be in the finance side, um, it doesn't have to be the way I did it. Like You're very familiar with a lot of the financial policies that are required. Um, you know, making sure um, separ separation of duties, all those things. So you come in in the finance role because you have access to the financials, because you understand the profitability and all that. What you'll see is that you'll start just getting involved because you can, because you're there, and because 
your expertise, your experience, your professionalism, your ability to document, your ability to make decisions, um, automatically will give you the skills you need to move over. Um, so that's, that's another thing I'd say. And then the last thing I'd say is um, this idea, and I, don't, I, find, I find it's more prevalent in the accounting world and in the legal world, and I don't know why, but there's this idea that, well, we just did our CPAs, we've grown up in the firm, we've made it to senior or manager, whatever, therefore, I can only leave the manager role for something better. But let me propose this to you. Um, you're going to work in an accounting firm and you know everything from day one. You know what your job title is going to be, you know what your salary increase is going to be. Um, back when I was at Ernst Young, they had the gold and silver award. I don't know if they still do that or not, but you're either going to win it or you're not. You're going to get promoted the next year, you're going to get your X percent increase and you're going to go up. And you know that eventually you're going to get roughly from what is it, anywhere from zero to five thousand dollar raises all the way through until you hit. Um, we no longer need you or we'd like you to be a partner. The other angle to go about is say, I'm going to leave this, I'm going to go and try myself in the startup world and I'm going to go and start off in customer service. And I'm going to take that because if you're really good at customer service, what people don't realize is customer service touches everything. They touch product, they touch profitability, they touch um, obviously customer service, they touch um, I, I can't think of what they don't touch. And so if you do that for a few years, you're gonna, I assure you, you'll move up quickly on that side of the team. Now you have your accounting years, you have your customer service years, or you can go into product or QA or whatever, and then you work your way back up. And the reason I bring this up is as that startup company grows, or whatever job you're in, it doesn't just mean startup, I am going to gamble that if you're as good at audit, if you're as good at your new job as you were in audit, that your growth trajectory and your satisfaction in career will be significantly higher. And so if you look at this as a zero to two year thing, you can't win, you'll be like, oh, I gotta stay on my trajectory. But if you look at it in a longer sort of viewpoint, then it's take a step backwards for, I think, much larger steps forward. Does that answer your question? Yeah, great. Um, you know, I'm actually going to jump into kind of our second topic because we kind of already have. It was all about just, you know, as CPAs, how, how do we know if we are capable of making that leap into, uh, you know, a different type of job, whether it is startup or something entirely different? Um, and how do you know if you're a good fit for these kinds of things? And one thing that you say all the time that I really agree with every day in my job is that no one knows anything. And uh, I'm definitely in that camp. I, every day we're trying to figure out what we're doing. That's just kind of part of being a startup. And you said it in a really funny way to me two days ago. You're like, that's why I'm so confident because nobody knows anything. So, you know, if I don't know anything, then uh, at least I'm on par. Um, so I think that, that, you know, kind of rolls into that question of how do you know that you can go and do this? I feel like we're into like the Jonasisms. Um, <laughs> How do I go through my life? So it is true. I did say that. Uh, I think I think that there's an interesting perspective um, for everyone who works, who has worked in a firm. And the first time you go to your client, and on the consulting side, it's you know this could be literally week after week you're going to a new client. And the thing that I always thought interesting is I never knew who to talk to. Who do I speak to? Um, what am I supposed to say? What are my responsibilities? What's considered a good job? Sometimes the manager wasn't even there. I was there on my own. And so I used to get a lot of anxiety over this. I'd walk in there and I was like, what do I do and how do I get out of this or what do I say on the first day? And you know, I'm going to talk to the CEO of a multi-million dollar company. How should I feel? And over the years, what I started realizing is what is it that people actually know? What is it that they know? How do they figure things out that they know? And it's the old cliche, failure is good. Um, and what I, the joke is, is that I don't think really everyone, I don't think anyone knows anything until they've experienced it. And so um, how do you know if you can walk into this part of the career? How do you know if you can leave that and go into the startup world is you guys have a tremendous network. So just as when you don't know what to do, you go to your manager and you say, how do I do this? Well, once you go on to the other side, the private side, the same thing still holds true. You can talk to... Um, really any expert, you can talk to your friends, your network, all of this is still accessible to you. 
And so if you have drive, if you have that professionalism to you, I think, it, I think it's, it, the answer is obviously anyone who has a desire to be on the other side, especially coming from your guys' background, is something that's very possible. It just has to make sure it measures with what your personal goals are and what your career goals are. I think once you figure that part out, then it's a very easy thing to do. Great. Um, any questions about just kind of that, um, that, I guess, that personal decision or, or, or whatever around making that kind of a career switch? I know we've kind of covered that over the stuff that we've been talking about, so I don't know if anybody has anything else they want to ask on that topic. Three, two, one, Marco. Okay, no, we're good. All right, so let's go to the, the next big topic, which is just like scaling a startup. Um, and that's really where I think we'll, we'll spend probably the most of our time now or the rest of our time on. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different topics here to cover. I, I guess the, the way that I will start it is just by saying like, how do you create an effective team? How do you design and manage an effective team to build something that's never really been done before? And then from there we can go to uh, the questions that people have in the audience. Well, I mean, the first answer is obviously you just hire people that are smarter than you. Um, and, I, and I think that truly is important. Um, I think when you're building out a team in a startup, you have to do it in a methodical way. And so um, one of the things you're doing is you're trying to manage and measure spend. And at the same time, you're trying to hire appropriately to create growth. And so when you're scaling out the business, I look at it as um, you try and run, in my opinion, try and run the finance team as, as bare minimum as you can. Um, and you really focus on whether it be business development, product, and customer service. And the reason I say that is at the end of the day, it's all about the customer and how you grow that team. So, um, but in order to do those things, the first thing that I think you have to do is you have to have some form of metrics. And so for a fan exchange, we invested heavily in Power BI, which is run by Microsoft. And we did that because, again, it's one thing to look at data from a financial perspective. It's another thing to be able to do it from a business operation perspective. And so understanding, for example, um, how many touch points there are on customer service for, for an order or, for example, um, how many errors after you launch a new product or do a release or um, uh, looking at uh, number of fraudulent orders if you're in online e-commerce, those types of things. Once we were able to understand how the business was operating, it made it very easy to understand where you needed to hire first. And so if you're looking at product, for example, making sure that we, we use Trello, for example, at one point. And the thing that allows us to do is able to see what our um, velocity was. How long did it take us to create our product strategy and then how long does it take to roll out? And then what we see is if we're slowing down and that our partners are waiting for product or that we're waiting for product and that our growth, every time we release a product, we were able to see growth, then it made sense that you would increase that side of the business. So I would say step one is you really have to have an understanding of your business, your data. Mm -hmm. And once you have that visible, uh, it makes it very easy to understand what part of the business you operate and what part of the business you grow first. Great. Um, so uh, on the topic of scaling a startup, uh, questions? Um, yeah. Uh, so for most of us coming from an analytical background, we're familiar with software as Excel and PowerPoint. But like you mentioned, some of these newer softwares now where you're, you're trying to take on roles that are more visualization, more effective. How do you stay adaptable for people that come from more traditional skill sets that are not programming as an example? So for someone like me who might be good at Excel but is not familiar with some of these new prep tech programs that might require programming, how do you stay competitive? How do you stay knowledgeable about it? So first of all, I, I'll argue uh, with anyone in the room that Excel is still the greatest tool on earth uh, <laughs> and that um, IBM and every other company has spent many years, for example, trying to create a forecasting tool, yet everyone I know still goes back to using Excel every you know, Q4 to prepare for the following year. So I don't think you're so far removed from that. And I would also argue that part of that challenge lies on the product side. So product has both an internal and an external responsibility. External is building products for users to use, but they also should play a role in the products we use internally in your company to help make us more effective. 
That being said, you gotta go to conferences. And, the, and it's actually not that hard. So for example, go to a Salesforce conference. Literally, uh, that's the best one because they have so many apps that tie into Salesforce. They have so many people there. It's at the palm of your hand. You know, they, they run them all the time in Toronto. You can go to, um, uh, we use Power BI. Um, you can use whatever different ones they are. Open text and all these people are running different sessions, they're all going on all the time. There's way more than even what I'm familiar with. Obviously I use what I'm comfortable with at this point, but that's the best way to do it. And I think that's important for anyone who wants to go into the startup world, is just to attend these conferences and start learning about different products. If reporting and analytics is something that's important to you and dashboard reporting and KPIs and all those things, and you want to know, you know how to calculate lifetime value or you want to know um, different ways to calculate GMV, gross merchandise value, um, then those are the types of things that you can either go to these courses or you can go to these conferences and see how they apply um, different, different applications, different software. So for example, next week I'm going to a Salesforce dinner where they're going to display uh, different reporting tools that they have that are focused on customer service. And so that's kind of how I do those things. But there's too many applications out there now to just say, oh, I'm gonna be an expert in applications. And then when you're in the startup world, what happens is you have, um, you have stress points. So for example, right now, um, we have a particular issue uh, in our company where our average phone call hold time is too long. And so I started looking at different chat solutions. I don't know anything about chat, but as the need comes up, you start researching those things. So I don't think it's so important that you have an idea or a grasp on all these different products. I think that you should choose one or two so you can speak to them, uh, especially depending on what industry of the startup world you're looking to join, and then really have an understanding of those, and then the rest you kind of get to as you go through your career and figure it out. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, at this point, I'd uh, just kind of maybe open it up as well, because we are nearing the, the end, and uh, if anybody's been to one of our events before, you know we like to uh, be pretty pretty good on time and, and not go uh, not go crazy over. But questions here? Any uh, anything else for Jonas? Got a couple. Why don't we see like how many questions do we have? I saw two. Any others in the crowd? Okay, maybe a third. Okay, so let's we'll try to get through two or three in the next uh, couple minutes, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, from supply chain analyst to uh, business to make consult a risk consultant seems like a big job. Uh, how do you convince Vernon and Ernst Young are uh, management uh, convince them you're the best candidates? How did how did I end up at Ernst Young from Canadian Tire? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Oh, it's much worse than that because I became a camp director first. <laughs> <laughs> then I ended up at Ernst Young. Um, <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Um, well, no, I'm not kidding. That is what happened. But uh, yeah, network. It, it, it pays dividends. Um, I did well in school. Um, Canadian Tire is a professional environment. Um, relationships was a big part of my role in uh, Canadian Tire. Uh, there's a funny story behind that part. Um, and so from, the, from entering the finance side, I had the academics for it. Um, I actually entered on the internal finance side. So I was actually working with the partners. Um, and so from supply chain uh, and my relationships with people who were working in the firm, I was able to get in that way. And then when I got there, I was like, it seems like it'd be a lot more fun to be traveling around. I was wrong about that part, but at the time, it seemed like a lot more fun. And so um, once I was in Ernst & Young, so there's a good example. I want to be a consultant at Ernst & Young, but I don't have experience. And I have you know, seven years of experience, so obviously I should be a consultant. But I was willing to take a step back. I worked in internal finance, made relationships with the partners while I was there, worked hard, and then the opportunity was, I always called it, they had like the wall of fame, it wasn't literally on a wall, but if you wanted to be a consultant, you had to pursue some type of professional designation. And I think it was like, you had your CMA, your CA, your MBA, or um, CFA at the time. And I really never understood what people were doing with their CFAs, um, and, I, and I thought that was much too difficult. But then the CMA was something I was able to do while I was still working. 
And so it just was the right fit. And once I had my designation, the firm was more than happy to see me go on the consulting side because uh, once you have your designation, you're, you're a billable asset for them. And so that was how it happened. Uh, a friend got me into internal finance. I did that for a bit, did my designation, and then moved on to the consulting side. So network. That's, uh, that's, that's probably uh, the, the best thing to do. I mean, people actually, just a quick comment on that. If people ask, ask me, oh, oh, how did you get you know, Lean Lee from All Simple or the Minister of Innovation at your events and stuff like that? It's like, honestly, I just went up and asked them. I mean, it's as simple as that. Nobody does it. And so if you're the one person that does, it's like, well, that, that guy's kind of out there. Um, so yeah. Um, we had one more question at the back. Hi. Uh, so of all the different hats and all the different roles that you've had, what have you found the most personal fulfilling or I guess the thing that you've sunk into the most that you're the most passionate about? Um, I like what I'm doing now. I really do. Uh, I think uh, Brandon, one of the founders, when I became COO, uh, he made a comment once, and I probably won't quote him properly, but um, it was along the lines of like, you know, with this role, you're now here for all the people. It, it's not you're just here for the accountants or you're just here for them. You have a responsibility to ensure the organization is operating in an efficient manner. And uh, it's opened my eyes to a whole bunch of things. Um, people who know me personally know that through business school, marketing wasn't um, something I had a lot of patience or time for. And yet, uh, at this point in my career and the amount of time I spend working with the marketing team, I have a real appreciation for what they're doing. Um, I get to explore new opportunities. I get to do new things. <coughs> so I, I, I think I, I really like what I'm doing now. Um, and I think that the opportunity I'm in, I have the autonomy to explore different things at different times. Um, but uh, my passion is, um, is, is, is travel and, and camp and so um, I often think about, you know, if, you know, maybe one day owning a camp or, or do something like that. Um, maybe for adults, do an adult camp or something like that. Uh, get away from our kids or something like that, just take <laughs> over a lake. But um, I, think, I think the CEO role I enjoy the most. And within that, it's funny, um, I don't think of myself as an um, extrovert, extrovert, extrovert. extroverted person, um, but I really enjoy sales. And I like when I get the opportunity to jump in on one of the larger business deals and um, sort of see that deal come to fruition. So that's been a lot of fun too, because Traditionally, I don't think that's something that I would have ever thought I would do. Great. Well, I, I think we have run out of time, so unfortunately, you'll, I'm sure Jonas will stick around for uh, a couple of minutes if, uh, if you want to ask some questions. But um, if everybody could just give Jonas a round of applause, and thanks so much for coming out today.